Good morning, church family. Good morning, church family. My name is Vicky, and today I will be doing the Bible reading, which comes from Hebrews 1, verse 5 to 14. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will row them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering, spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? This is the word of the Lord. Morning, everybody. Uh, it's really good to be with you. We've already prayed, so I'm going to jump straight in. When I say the word mediator, what do you think of? Some of us will jump straight to the CCMA, the Commission for Conciliation Mediation, and arbitration. And that's a helpful link in some ways uh, because mediation implies two parties and they are at loggerheads. So at the CCMA, it's the employer and the employee and the commission is the mediator. That helps us understand the role of a mediator. The mediator's role is to bring the two parties together because the very fact that they need mediation tells us that there's distance between them. As a married couple, you don't go for mediation on your honeymoon. At least I hope you didn't. Mediation is only necessary when there is some distance. And that distance is the ground between the two parties. That's the distance the mediator has to cover. In this early part of the letter to the Hebrews, it's just assumed that the two parties are God and man. It's just assumed that the two parties are at loggerheads. It's also assumed that the distance is so great that a mediator is essential. Now, there are clues to this, but it only really gets spelt out later on in the letter. Right here in these early verses, the writer just assumes that it's obvious to his readers. Not so with us, is it? We don't make the same assumption. At least some of us assume the exact opposite. We assume that if there is a God, he's a God of love. And I'm quite lovable. We think that uh, God is some sort of, we think of God as some sort of waiter, as a kind of a waiter. He'll be here for me. And he'll be here for me, uh, firstly, because I'm me and I'm worth it. I'm friendly, I'm affable, I'm likable, I'm the kind of person you would want to wait on. Secondly, he'll wait on me because it's his job after all. I mean, what else is he going to do? And thirdly, he'll wait on me because, well, there might just be something in it for him if he performs. There might just be a tip at the end. He might just get 10% of my income and maybe I'll throw in a prayer or two. That's how some of us think of God. Why would there even need to be a mediator? You don't need someone between you and the waiter. Others of us recognize the need for a mediator. We know that there's something wrong, something Something is out in this relationship. And perhaps you're carrying a heavy burden that the problem is me. I wouldn't dare to approach God on my own. So I have to find myself a mediator. Maybe that person is a priest. Maybe it's the man of God. I can't possibly talk to God myself. But the man of God can. And so I'm going to give him 500 rand and he'll pray for me. It's money well spent. The mediator might be the Amadlozi, 
I've got real problems in the here and now. My finances are a mess. I'm fighting with my wife. My kids are struggling with homeschool. I need the power of an Nkulukulu exercised in my favor. And the Amadlozi have access to that power. They could be angry with me. They could be using it against me. But if I treat them right, then they could use it in my favor. I'm going to ask them. They'll mediate. So some of us see no need for a mediator. Others are desperate for a mediator. So desperate. They look around for the options. There's one more kind of person. She's a kind of halfway house. She knows there's distance between her and God. Perhaps enormous distance. But she doesn't look for another mediator. She tries to cover that distance herself. She tries and tries and tries to build that bridge back to God with her own hands. She does it in a whole host of ways. She does it through volunteering for the adult literacy program. She does it by staying away from alcohol. She has a strict fitness regime. She watches her diet. She's the chair lady of her body corporate. She has her kids perfectly organized for homeschool. She makes herself worthy of others and worthy of God in all of these ways and a hundred other ways. She is her own mediator. So those are the three approaches as far as I can see it. I don't need a mediator. I'll find my own mediator. I'll be my own mediator. The writer to the Hebrews rejects all of them. Rules them out of court, emphatically. Because the community he was writing to was certainly in the habit of looking for mediators. The first time we bump into this habit is already there in the, in the fourth verse. Chapter 1, verse 4, you see it there? Angels. This community of Christian disciples were looking to angels to mediate their relationship with God. Now, we are modern people. We may need a little help understanding this. In fact, we may even need a little help understanding angels. Well, we get that help straight from our passage. Look at verse 14. Angels are ministering spirits who serve mankind. And there in verse 7, angels are ministering spirits who serve God. They are also winds and flames of fire. In other words, they are splendid in their power. We know from the rest of the Bible that in terms of the splendor of their power, they are the most exalted of all the creatures. Put it together, and we've got a profile of angels. They are non-material, powerful beings that serve God and serve mankind. And so in that sense, they are the perfect mediators. We can completely understand why this community looks to them for mediation. For the same reasons we look to the Ahmad Lozi as mediators. They have access to the power of God, and so they can help us. But there's more to it. Remember, this is a community of Jewish converts. The reason for their focus on angels comes from their history as the Jewish nation. You'll remember, they lost everything. They lost the land, they lost the temple, they lost their king. They were dragged off by foreign powers to foreign lands. They were in exile, and if they learned anything in exile, they learned this. Idolatry is dangerous. They learned that it is of the utmost importance to worship the one true God, God Almighty, the sovereign over the universe. During this period, they so stressed the holiness, the power, the majesty, the transcendence of God, the otherness of God, the distance between God and themselves, that they recognized their deep need for a mediator. And of course, angels were the perfect candidates. In fact, there's biblical precedent. They read in Deuteronomy that it was angels who mediated the covenant between God and Moses. Angels were powerful spiritual beings who served mankind and had access to God. Why wouldn't you choose angels? Especially if we consider that they were under pressure, that they were a community that was persecuted that they were suffering for their faith. I mean, they were so tempted to think, doesn't Jesus need just a little help from the angels? The whole point of our passage, the reason the writer writes Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 through 14, 
is to remind this community that Jesus is better. In fact, it's the purpose he wrote the whole letter. Jesus is better. He's not better by degree. He's better by category. I'm not going to speak to that now. We'll cover it in the next few weeks. But let me give it to you so that you can chew over it, so that you can meditate on it. Jesus is better, not by degree, but by category. Jesus is a better mediator even than angels. That's the writer's point. He wants to stress it so much that he makes the same point in seven different ways in these few verses. And because he wants to say it in a language his readers could understand, he says it from the Jewish Bible, from from the Old Testament. Now just as an aside, because we're going to bump into this time and time and time again in the book of Hebrews, look at how the writer treats the scriptures. He has such a high elevated view of the scriptures. The Bible, the scriptures, are the very words of God. Just look there in verse 5. He writes, God says, and then he quotes the scripture. In other words, in the scripture, God himself is speaking. There's something in that for us. But back to mediation. Jesus is a better mediator because, and here are the seven reasons he gives. He's a son by nature. He is worshipped by angels. He sits on an eternal throne. He is creator, not mere creature. He will remain. He is victorious. And he's a savior. So here we go. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5. He's a son by nature. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be a father. I will be to him a father. And he shall be to me a son. The first quotation there is from Psalm 2 and the second is from 2 Samuel 7. Both of those, in both of those passages, God is proclaiming that this person is or will be his son. In both of them, the person in question is the Davidic king, a king in the line of David. Now, just bear in mind, to say that someone is your son is to say that they bear the family likeness. They bear the family name. So what does it mean for the Davidic king to be the son of God? In what sense is the Davidic king bearing the family likeness? Well, when God says to the Davidic king, you are my son, it means David is godlike in his rule. He is an agent of God's own rule and reign. Now, of course, we've read the Old Testament We've heard the stories. When it comes to David or Solomon, we know their record. And it's utterly wayward. We know the murder, the lust, the greed, the idolatry. If anything, they were sons by grace. It was a gift of the covenant. But when these words are applied to Jesus, we know from what we read last week, those first four verses, we know from last week's sermon, when these words were applied to Jesus, It's crystal clear. Jesus is not a son by grace. He's a son by nature. Only Jesus is eternally God's son. Only Jesus is a perfect agent of God's rule. Do you see now why Jesus is a better mediator than angels? Angels are created servants. Jesus is the son who rules by nature. He is better by category, not by degree. And that was good news for the Hebrews. It's good news for us. Imagine you're in prison and you're pinning all your hopes on a presidential pardon. You've got to get a message to the president. Uh, You know two people in his inner circle. Two people, you know his chauffeur and you know his son. Now. Which one are you going to pick to advocate for you? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? You're going to pick the son. The son has the father's ear. The son has the father's trust. Generally speaking, even if the relationship is strained, the son has greater access and influence with the father. How much more so in the perfect father-son relationship where there is no family baggage or politics? Jesus is a better mediator because he is God's son by nature, and because he rules 
perfectly as God's king. Second reason he's better. He's better because he's worshipped by angels. Verse 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels worship him. With this quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 32, the writer is making the simple point that the angels themselves declare Jesus to be a better mediator. He's saying to his readers, you want to worship angels, but the angels themselves worship Jesus. When he was born, they worshipped him. That Old Testament quote is from the Song of Moses, which celebrates God's victories over his enemies and the cleansing of the land. We see something very similar in Luke's Gospel when the heavenly armies of God praise God at the birth of Jesus. It's Luke chapter 2 verse 13 and I'll read it for you. And suddenly there was the angel, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly armies praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. God's victory will come through this baby. And so the angels worship him. The angels themselves declare Jesus to be a better mediator. Now, where does that leave our mediators? Where does that leave the Amadlosi? You know, when I was at college, there was an older man, much respected by uh, the student body, a man called Timothy Miyambo, and he was doing his PhD on ancestral worship. And after he had studied the scriptures and he had studied the culture, he concluded that the power in ancestral worship is demonic. In other words, you are not communicating with your ancestors. You are communicating with demons posing as your ancestors. So there is power there, make no mistake. And, and, and many of you who have experienced this thing firsthand, you know there's power there. But it's just not the power you might think it is. The whole hierarchy of ancestors is a cultural construct that the devil uses to enslave us. In the very same way that he uses the cultural con construct of Western materialism to enslave us. He has many traps. The devil is wily. He will use whatever it takes to enslave us. Timothy Miyambo's thesis was that the Amadlozi are not our ancestors. They are a cultural imagination captured by demons. What are demons? They are fallen angels. Now angels do one of two things when they encounter the living Lord Jesus. They either worship or they shudder. Whichever it is, they are acknowledging Jesus is a better mediator. Three. He's better because he sits on an eternal throne. Verse 7. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The angels are mere servants. They are powerful servants, but they are servants nonetheless. The Son sits on the throne forever. It's a quote from Psalm 95. And again, it refers to the Davidic king. Once again, the Davidic king is compared to God himself. He's even addressed as God because he is God's agent in ruling and reigning. But I just want us to notice, just to pause and notice the righteousness of his rule. Righteousness is his scepter. It's his instrument of reign. He loves righteousness. Finally, a lo at long last, a, a just ruler. Finally, a leader who isn't corrupted by power. If absolute power corrupts absolutely, then a king who wields the power of God should be cor as corrupt as Satan himself. But not this king. This king exercises all power. For justice. Psalm 45, I'm sure we can see now that the words of Psalm 45 are only ever fully, truly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It seems the more power he exercised, the more he did what was good 
and right. And those two things normally run in opposite directions. The more power means not more goodness, not more righteousness, but more corruption. Not so with Jesus. Don't you want him as your king? Don't you want him as your mediator? Perfect in power, but also perfect in love. Fourth, Jesus is better because he is creator. Just listen to the words that the writer applies to Jesus. Verse 10. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In Psalm 104, these words are addressed to the creator God, the one who said, let there be light, and there was light. In, here in Hebrews 1, the same words are applied to Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's boy. We remember John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Just like he is the father's agent in ruling, so he was the father's agent in creating. Now, if we were to draw a line separating the creator from the creature, well, angels are very much on this side of the line, below the line. But Jesus obliterates the line. He breaks through the line from both sides. He is God as man. We need to be crystal clear on this because ever since the 4th century, the church has gotten this very wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses get this very wrong. Christians get this very wrong every time we treat Jesus as if he's a, just simply an ancient version of Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, or the Dalai Lama, or Mother Teresa, or Mahatma Gandhi. You know, Jesus, what a wonderful human being. Or, Jesus, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Jesus is a better mediator because he represents us, creatures, to the creator, as creator. He was there in the beginning. Five. Jesus is a better mediator because he will remain. From verse 10 again, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They all wear out like a garment, like a robe you will roll them up, like a garment they will be changed, but you are the same. And your, year, your years will have no end. Now one day, what, the, what this text is telling us is one day Jesus is going to roll up the universe like a tired, old, worn, moth-eaten, dusty picnic blanket and chuck it to one side. But he will remain. And that's the universe. That's the universe. Astronomers estimate that there are 350 billion large galaxies in the universe. Our galaxies of a very average size. Now, size. Now, if you were to take the sun, we want to shrink this down to get it to a scale where we can begin to fathom. But if you were to take the sun and you were to shrink it down to the size of a one rand coin, our very average galaxy would still span 12 million kilometers. If our sun was the size of a one rand coin, then the nearest the next nearest star would still be 600 kilometers away. Our solar system, the body of planets orbiting around this very average star, is 36 billion times larger than the Earth. And the Earth itself is 3.5 million times larger than you. Are you feeling small? I hope so. Because you are. You are small. Both in space and in time. A mere pinprick. Stephen Hawking said, we are just an advanced breed of monkeys on a minor planet of a very average star. He was right about one thing. The spirit of humility. When you look around at this world, when you look up at the world, that this extraordinary world that God has made, humility. Humility. And the Bible got there long before Hawking. The Bible describes you and I as a mist, a shadow, a vapor, a withering plant, a breath. 
You get the picture. Here today, gone tomorrow. But we don't see it that way, do we? When I was at university, I had a friend who died in a drunk driving car accident. And I remember uh, at the funeral, after the funeral, uh, standing chatting to his father, who was telling me through tears that this guy thought he was bulletproof. He thought it was never going to end. He thought he was immortal. Now, you don't have to be 21 to think that way. I know many 70-year-olds who think that way. They pretend it's never going to end. They're in total denial of their mortality. And even if they do acknowledge it, we tend to have a kind of Hollywood picture of what the end is going to be like. You know, we're going to go out in glory. A hospital room is going to be crowded. People are going to be spilling out into the corridor. They're going to be gathered around our bed, uh, weeping, wailing, singing our praises as we pass with serenity and dignity. The reality is that we may be gagging for breath, covered in sweat or blood or feces. And I'm not trying to be gory and I'm not trying to be morbid. But death is not always pretty and peaceful. We may be scared, alone, full of regret. You see, we are small and fragile, and death is a nasty intruder that comes to us all. We have 70, 80, 90 years at best, and then we're gone. And in two generations, it's like we never existed. Who remembers yesterday's shadow? We have 70, 80, 90 years. The universe has billions of years. But Jesus is going to roll it up like a blanket. He's going to cast it aside like an old t-shirt. Only Jesus remains. If I need a mediator, and I do, I want him. Six. Jesus is a better mediator because he wins. Verse 13, and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? It's a quote from Psalm 110. That is the chapter most quoted in the New Testament. Of all the Old Testament chapters, Psalm 110 is the most quoted chapter. And once again, what we have is the Davidic king seated at the right hand of God, as an agent of God, enjoying the victory of God. Once again, when it is applied to Jesus, it applies perfectly. The king enjoys an exalted status at the right hand of God. The enemies of the king, the enemies of the king's people are vanquished. They are utterly defeated. And the book of Hebrews makes it crystal clear who the enemies of the king and the king's people are. Sin. Satan, death. These are formidable enemies. But there's an even bigger enemy lurking behind them. You find it in all the warning passages in Hebrews. And that enemy is the wrath of God himself. Some people are confused about what salvation actually is. But not the writer to the Hebrews. We'll talk more about this next week. For now it's enough to say that God's wrath is the biggest enemy to be overcome. It is the very reason we need a mediator to begin with. And this mediator, this Jesus, through his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God, has overcome. He has overcome. He is victorious. He is seated on his throne. Angels could never win this victory. They are mere creatures. They are mere servants. Our seventh reason, our final reason, says as much. Jesus is better because he's Savior. Verse 14. Are angels not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Angels are spirits sent by God to serve those who will inherit salvation. 
Our passage is bracketed, top and tailed if you like, by Jesus sitting at the right hand of God as the exalted Savior King who has secured an inheritance for his people. So, verse 3 and 4 says, After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. That's the top end. Here's the tail. Verse, verses 13 and 14 say, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Do you see it? If you look at verses 3 and 4, you have an almost perfect match for them in verses 13 to 14. Almost every element is there. So you have a match for Jesus sitting at the right hand. You have this comparison between the king and the angels. You have the inheritance. The only thing at the end that we don't find at the beginning is the word salvation. What is salvation? Well, we go back to the beginning where it describes salvation in other words. There it is in verse 3. Purification for sins. That is our salvation. Our sins are purified. And we are rescued from the wrath of God. Jesus is a better mediator because he is both king and savior. That's it. That's the case. And I think it is watertight. It is emphatic. Jesus is a better mediator than angels. Just bear in mind that angels are the best mediators there are in the created order. It doesn't get any better than angels. Doesn't that say a lot to you? That even angels weren't enough? Doesn't it make us pause and think just how far is the distance between God and me? Not even angels can bridge that gap. Just how far is that distance? Doesn't it make you wonder just how offensive is my sin? That the Father must send His one and only Son, His Son by nature, to make purification for my sin in the most difficult, painful, traumatic, grueling way imaginable. I hope you think about that. And then I hope you also stop to think, you know the distance between God and me is not just a measure of my sin. It's also a measure of his love. Finally, doesn't it make you think just how pathetic our mediators are? How could I ever, ever begin to imagine that God is my waiter? It's blasphemous. How could I ever want to go to my priest when I could go to Jesus? The Ahmad Lawsi, who are they? What are they? I don't need them. And as for building my own bridge back to God, it's ridiculous, it's pathetic, it's tragic. I would sooner be able to build a sandcastle to the moon than to work my way back to God. There are many mediators. Whoever your mediator is, Jesus is better. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, your one and only son by nature. Your son by nature. We thank you that he has made us sons and daughters by grace. Thank you that by your spirit we are invited into your father-son relationship. Lord, we have no place there. But your nature is loving and merciful. And in Jesus, you have covered the distance between us. Father, some of us, you know all too well, Lord, that some of us are still enslaved to other mediators. Some of us are under the illusion that we don't need a mediator. Or that we can choose our own mediator. Or that we can be our own mediator. Father, rescue us. Save us from our sinful folly. 
save us by the saving person and work of the Savior King. We pray, we can only pray, in the name of the one true mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's been good to be with you all this morning. Um, I hope that uh, you'll be joining one of our life groups for a coffee hangout after the after the service. Uh, if you're not part of a life group, don't worry. Just uh, look it up on the list and uh, contact a life group leader and they will be more than willing to add you uh, to the Zoom meeting or whatever platform they're meeting on. Uh, we just gather in our life groups to uh, discuss the sermon and to have over a cup of coffee as we would if we were physically together. So please consider doing that. Join a coffee hangout and um, spend some time in fellowship with other believers. Otherwise, God bless you all. Have a good, uh, productive week in the Lord, and we'll gather again next Sunday. Take care.